My name is Jason. My name is Judd. And this is The Sixth Ring, a podcast about the trophy tabletop role-playing game. And today we are talking about the city. Setting out. Judd, how is your trophy gaming going? What's been going on? It's been really good. That game is fun. We just had... I think the second and third characters had died like all at once. Nice. Yeah, (laughs) it was brutal. (laughs) It came out out of a devil's bargain. So I think it's worth talking about. There was, I called it a uh, a moon gator. And it was just like an albino alligator swimming around in the ruins of the city that, that were flooded. And we were doing a devil's bargain. Somebody was swimming into the city to try to find something. And one of the players for the Devil's Bargain was like, yeah, there's something bigger than the Moon Gator in there. And you like watch the Moon Gator get eaten. Oh, nice. (laughs) And I was like, oh, wow. Okay. I've got to think of a bigger, badder thing than the Moon Gator. There's always a bigger fish. Right. Rich will appreciate that one. Yes. (laughs) Thank you, Phantom Menace. And so there was a squid in there and it decimated the party. It caused everybody to run. And one person failed their risk roll to get away and so they didn't get away another person died trying to like do a final fire emoliation to destroy the beast and just it fell flat on his face so one character died and then another character died it was it was brutal what i love about this is because it was the result of a devil's bargain right there's a certain amount of player consent right in right to this result I, I didn't put the squid there. I literally did not put the squid there. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's and, and it's also yeah. cool that I get to learn things about the setting and be as surprised as anybody else, which is a lot of fun. Yeah, it was cool. And it's going well. And the other players love making new characters. Okay. They yeah. love the online character maker. They love just clicking on it and seeing what comes out. And I think because they can make a character really quickly and like who they come out with, death isn't that big of a deal. It still is a big deal, and we definitely do like wake the characters and and remember them. The deaths definitely have an effect on the other characters in a way that I like, but it's not the huge bummer that it could be. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I haven't had many characters die in my campaigns of Trophy Gold so far, and I think maybe I'm being too easy on them or something. I don't know. Maybe the players are just really clever. That's a pretty big, like embracing danger kind of move to say there's a giant squid there that eats the already giant alligator right Right. so right but you know the groups are still having we're we're having a good time even though we're not getting that like kind of grindy osr death thing going on or whatever it might just be that you haven't had enough battles yet it could be i don't like lean into combat as a thing so that's probably part of it right i like more like social encounters i think so yeah that's probably part of it i definitely do too but i'm definitely all four folks thinking their way around combat yeah and yeah. avoiding it and they got really lucky for a really long time i feel like a lot of their like their first bunch of fights where one round goes and things were all right and there was an interesting one a couple weeks ago where it took three rounds and that's a long time. And people were getting hurt, but they weren't. Those are the best, though. It's so tense. I yeah, it was combats. really tense. Yeah. And I talked about it in game. And I said, this is the longest any of these fights has lasted for you folks. You hit this point in your endurance where your body is saying this should be over. Yeah. And it's not. And the cultists who you're fighting are clearly not breaking like most people do when you fight them and they're better trained than you thought they were yeah they're digging in like ticks too and and they ended up winning and and not taking a whole lot i think some of the faster fights were actually more brutal but yeah it was interesting it was interesting watching everybody just run for it and seeing how that went it's been a lot of fun everybody's really enjoying it the group is maybe a little bit too big when everybody shows up now (laughs) <laughs> that's always fun <laughs> yeah we started at like four and now sometimes and i was hoping we'd have six but not everybody would show and we're getting a lot of nights where everybody shows up at for six. Oh, good yeah these are having fun so that's good yeah and yeah. it's holding up i think it holds up pretty well interestingly that the bigger the group the more dangerous the combat in some ways right yeah it, there's a lot of like calculation that the group does i think at that point yeah, yeah for sure yeah but it's going well i'm having a lot of fun i'm, I'm having fun awesome grabbing old modules Oh, you're you're doing conversions. Yeah, I'm I'm doing a bunch of conversions. I did Tomb of Horrors. Right, that's right. You talked you talked about that last time. Yeah, we we did Thunderspire Labyrinth was the last one that we just finished. 
it's been a lot of fun. So th- there was a moment last game that I thought was interesting where there was this flooded city and the players did something that I should have seen coming and just didn't. And they said, you know what? We're going to drain the city and go for the big money. Oh, yeah. I remember you posting about this on Discord. Yeah. So, yeah. I was like, oh, shit. I did not see that coming. Suddenly it's like, what's down there? What is down there? <laughs> yeah. They beat the squid and they risked so much. And they got a lot, a lot, a lot of gold. I think one of the players is going to be able to retire, which is cool. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And that player has been there since the first game. Okay. So he's been yeah. going at this for a really long time. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting to see a player retire. It's going to be interesting to see what happens with this newly drained Minotaur ruined city. Mm -hmm. And how did, you know, how is that going to change the setting and all that? Yeah, that sounds really fun. I I think next time or in a future episode, we definitely need to talk about those conversions because I've mostly been running written for trophy gold incursions lately. Although I, I have done some conversions and I talk about those on my other show. But I'm kind of, I think at some point I'd like to ping you on that process and how you find it. That'd be awesome. Let's do it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, let's just go to the next segment. Yeah. Clawing for gold. Okay. So we, meaning the publishing outfit that I run, (laughs) we have published a trophy gold incursion called Top of the World. It can be found in the most recent issue of the Codex magazine, which is the magazine we publish at Gauntlet Publishing. And I want to talk about that a little bit. It's more of a Trojan horse to talk about something else. (laughs) And so Top of the World, briefly, it's a trophy gold incursion by Jim Crocker. It takes place across the rooftops of a grand city. The idea here is the characters start the incursion kind of on the run from the city guard, and every set is a different district of the city. This incursion has a very high adventure kind of feel, a very Pratchett kind of feel, or like Gentleman Bastards. It's got that energy to it. It's pretty different as far as trophy gold incursions go. Jesse and I talked about this one for the Trophy Gold contest. Uh, It was one of the runners up and we decided to publish it. Jesse and I go into it pretty deeply on that special contest episode we did. But before I get to the what I really want to talk about, what do you think of Top of the World just from a read? I think it's great. It feels iconic. Rooftop chases are an iconic thing. And then I love the idea of distilling a city into an incursion and making the city itself an incursion. I just think that's really cool. And when you're done with that, you probably have a pretty fleshed out city, right? If you take notes on the things that you come up with, you end up with this kind of cool setting. I think you're right what you've said about it. It's a surprisingly focused incursion because it just takes place on the rooftops and the characters occasionally dip down to go like, steal from a building or or have a little encounter down in the streets, but they always kind of end up back on the roofs. And so it's a little bit more contained than you would think. I ran it for the uh, YouTube campaign. And now that you mention it, we created a lot of story there. We introduced lots of NPCs. We had lots of new chewy things to play with in our campaign. And so, yeah, that definitely, I think just being in a city environment will do that because there's more opportunities to encounter characters in different kinds of scenarios, you know, as opposed to a sort of more blinkered kind of dungeon crawl experience but what i kind of want to talk about here Mm -hmm. (laughs) i do want to claw for your gold listeners please go get codex but what i really want to talk about is urban adventures and not just in trophy necessarily but like just in general yeah because this came up in a conversation somewhere i can't remember where but do games that are kind of designed to be stories about crawling around in catacombs or dark forests does that work in an urban environment and what are the challenges in an urban environment yeah or is the premise flawed like are there any challenges that's kind of what i want to talk about i think there are and i think the thing with cities is that they can feel so big it feels like an impossible space to fill right there are a million stories in the naked city right so it is the challenge that every gm has in every game which is narrowing that down and making the little parts that you can see feel real while still showing a bit of the rest of the city around it. And I think there are a bunch of different ways to do that. Finding a city that you know or that you're fascinated by and reading up a little bit about it. And now's a day where you can go on Instagram and just put in hashtag Prague. You'll have a thousand pictures of people just running around Prague. You'll have moments in a, a couple of seconds, right? You'll have your moments all filled out. Yeah, I think it's just a matter of finding a city that you want to kind of 
riff off of and using that to kind of narrow things down. It can be a way to start. The challenge is that sort of open-endedness of the urban environment. Yeah. As I've kind of alluded to, in a dungeon, there's only so many places you can go. <laughs> and the information that that the GM needs is probably a little more readily on hand because they may not have to flip through a big book or just come up with something on the fly. Yeah. Sort of like piggybacking off what you said, something that makes Top of the World, this incursion by Jim, so successful is that it takes place on the rooftops. It always kind of funnels them back up to the roofs. And so it's a dungeon-like space, even though it's not a dungeon. Right. And so there is some constraint. But they do still get to experience the city in different ways. And they do still get the sense of the sort of vastness of the city and the possibility of the city. What's tricky, I think, (laughs) is if... You don't have a slightly artificial constraining device that prevents the player characters from just wandering off and doing whatever they want to do. Yeah. That, I think, is a tricky part of running an urban adventure when when they want to really be in a sandbox, you know, if you're not ready for that sandbox. Yeah. One of the things I wrote down in my notes for how do you deal with the sandbox is just having those kind of inspirational tables, right? With a a D6 list of elements for each borough or each little part of the city but then grab another part of the city that has like so like let's say you have five boroughs right and you have a a d-six list for every borough but then you you mix things right so like one of the great examples from from jim's adventure is the is there's at, at one point you're in this kind of slum and there's this cat that has like declared itself a king of like the little you know furry creatures and it it's clearly this pampered cat who has made this new life from the rich part of town. Right. Yeah. And I love yeah. that. I love that because that's the type of thing that happens. A cat from Manhattan like gets lost on a train and ends up in the Bronx and has to like, just find a new way of, of, of living. And I love that. So yeah, I think having a, you know, a little, uh, just a D6 for every little part of the city, you know, whether it's the outer walls, the inner walls, the forbidden city in the middle, what, what, however you want to do it, have a list of elements and that way you can mix and match them and there are things that won't necessarily make sense no i what you're saying makes total sense i mean i'm reminded of i don't know if you're familiar with this somewhat older now osr book called um, yun suen and yeah. yun suen is a big part of the book is about this city called the yellow city and there's very, very little prose description of anything in this book about the city. It's all tables. It's just completely table driven. And you use these tables to sort of create city elements on the fly. And um, I've run it several times and it does work pretty well. So that is a an endorsement of your tip there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, lots of, like tables are a helpful way of quickly getting to something when you need it fast in a city adventure. I, what I think is interesting is how it feels like over the past few decades in the hobby, authors have sort of figured this out. You can kind of see this progression of like how things kind of were and now how things kind of are. I'm reminded of that old D&D module, The Veiled Society, which we covered on Fear of a Black Dragon. Yeah. Their solution to the problem of trying to avoid a free wandering sandbox thing is to put it tightly on rails, right? I mean, it's so tightly on rails to the point where it has like scripted events that basically are just pushing the characters through the flow of the adventure, right? The player's choices make almost no difference. Right. That's like one way of doing it. There were a few modules like that back then, but now we have this sort of like more abstract table-based approach. And I think that's super interesting. I also think it's, you get like kind of a mix in there with like stuff like say cyberpunk and night city, right? Like the way cities are presented and the different ways it constrains the missions and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Just from a design standpoint, it's interesting to me. Absolutely. I think there are a ton of different ways to deal with that wide open space. Something you said reminded me of the ways cities combine things that you wouldn't necessarily think of. I vividly remember watching TV with my dad years ago and the Orthodox Jewish reggae singer Matas Yahu came on and my dad was like how does that happen and I was like Brooklyn is how that happens <laughs> right, things that yeah. you wouldn't cultural pieces that you wouldn't necessarily put together in your head are just going to th- get thrown together in a cool way and yeah I think that's the kind of cool stuff that can happen in a city so when you roll on those tables and it doesn't seem to make sense uh, think about it with an open mind think about how it could make yeah, sense yeah no, absolutely yeah something I find tricky just sort of to 
divert the conversation a little bit. Yeah. Something I find tricky about running any adventure with lots of NPCs, but particularly big city heavy adventures, is having lots of NPCs and having to portray lots of NPCs and making the NPCs feel distinct from one another so that players don't get confused. Right. And this is a particular problem because the kinds of games I like to run are usually about like solving mysteries. Even in fantasy games, it's about solving mysteries. And so yeah, yeah. You have to be able to keep the character straight. I've got some tips for that, but I'm just curious to get your thoughts. Like, how do you sort of handle the NPC bloat or just the job of presenting all these NPCs? Giving them a detail for folks to stick to. Yes. Whether that's a silly voice or a cool image or body tick or something yeah mm-hmm. tick or or cast them be like hey this would totally be you know a young jeff goldblum perfect yeah. and then they they know who that person is and and just finding art you know if you're playing online nowadays you probably are throwing the art up mm-hmm. sharing your screen and saying you know this is the npc you're talking to right now giving the players a board to kind of put the npc on and, and write notes about them so that they can kind of keep things straight yeah, I think giving them that one little detail. I think that's right. Tom and I talk about this a lot on Fear of a Black Dragon, and he likes a lot of the things that you mentioned, like having central casting for all the NPCs, right? You yeah. Know, different actors portraying various characters. Um, I like the trait method, you know, where they have like a, there's a way you characterize them at the table that helps them be distinct, whether that be a voice or a, an accent or a, just the way you move your body, you know, yep. the way you position your body can yep. do that. Those are all good ways. Online, you're right. There actually is a big advantage there. You can actually just keep a nice updated, ever expanding board of pictures that helps folks kind of keep that yeah. in their head. I think the the real key here is you just have to have a plan of attack. Yep. If you are not the kind of GM who is comfortable with vocal characterizations, say, and many GMs are not, and that's perfectly fine, come up with some other way of making the NPCs feel distinct. I think that's a big, big hurdle cleared in the urban adventure if yeah. you can get your npc characterizations or the way you make them distinct if you can kind of get that under control you're in good shape yeah like every bit of gaming i think be very open to the players not taking in that npc the way you thought they would true i have yep. definitely daydreamed about an npc for a while and thought oh this is a really interesting person and then had the players just hate them <laughs> You know, sometimes I'll ask, I'll be like, why did you hate them so much? Like, I don't even know what's going on. And sometimes I'm like, oh, I see what happened. In the intro, like they got set up in a weird way. They had a rough start. Just be ready for someone who you thought was going to be the main person to just get fired. No, I love that. That's great. Well, listeners, definitely go check out Top of the World, just to bring it back to Top of the World. Yeah. Uh, It's available in Codex Home, which is currently available on the Gauntlet Patreon and will be until, I think, like mid-December. You can go get that there. Otherwise, it'll be on DriveThru at some point. We'll have links in the show notes. Yeah. Let's go to the next segment. Into the Forest Dark. Okay, so today we're talking about set goals. Now, as always... This show assumes you know what we're talking about as far as the terminology and stuff goes, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about sets and set goals. We assume you have read this part of the rules. But what I want to talk about is big picture, what are they, I suppose? Um, How do they work? But more importantly, how can we use set goals to create scenarios that go beyond dungeon crawling? This came up on Discord a couple weeks ago, and I wanted to touch on it. I kind of promised we would. I do want to say, though, that I think that set goals are a particularly rich vein for gameplay theory discussion and design discussion. And so I don't think this is the last time we're going to talk about set goals on this show. But this is a good entree into the topic. What are set goals per the Trophy Gold rules? And per the rules of the game, they are the reason the treasure hunters are in the set. Sets, of course, being the subdivision of an incursion. My interpretation of what a set goal is, is that they are a signpost for what we as players care about in the story. Okay, Sometimes it's what the characters care about, but it should always be something that the players care about. There's a distinction there that I think is important. There are a way for the GM to help the players not have to like dig in the hay for that one pin. It's just like, yes. hey, this is the pin. Like the pin is in there. <laughs> right. Yep. <laughs> now go look. So rather than being like, oh, wow, I don't even know if there is a pin. You can just be like, hey, there's a pin in the hay. Looking should be fun. And if you want to get past it, there's a resource to get past it. I mean, I really noticed the set goal stuff when you are making a traditional 
module into a trophy gold incursion like it then they really show yeah yeah because you're saying what this part of the dungeon is about before they would have had to have kind of suffer through it you know as so often happens when we record this yes you say something that causes me to have a thunderstroke of inspiration <laughs> and we're here again because what you just said it occurs to me that something i don't love about osr play all the right. time i mean is i feel like sometimes in osr games i've played there's like a puzzle i was supposed to find or do or a thing i was supposed to do and as a player, I had no idea or I couldn't figure it out. And yeah. so we just got kind of stuck. That's happened more times than I care to go over. In this way, set goals sort of solve that problem. And I think the reason why they're able to solve that problem, just to kind of tie it back into what I said, which is the thing about set goals is there's a sort of division of information between what the characters know and what the players know. And if the players know things that the characters don't know, they can play their characters in a way that's more effective that will get the story kind of moving in the direction it needs to go right obviously some people will not like that as a play philosophy and that's okay not every game has to be for every person but i like it in practice and so that kind of like gets to the next thing i want to talk about which is just a sort of basic idea of how they work in play or how they're supposed to work Mm -hmm. now essentially you introduce them whenever the treasure hunters enter the new set of the incursion Now, Jesse Ross, the author of Trophy, the way he presents it in the rules and the way I've saw him speak about it in other places is that it's the goals introduced sort of in the fiction. So, for example, you would say the villager abducted by the fishmen sits in a rickety wooden cage suspended over the rolling underground lake. How will you get to him? My way of doing it is a little more simple, perhaps, which is just to literally read the set goal to the players, which might be. Free the villager hanging from the rickety wooden cage over the lake. Oh, that's the, that's <laughs> yeah. totally how I've done it. Now I feel like I've been doing it wrong. Okay. That's how I do it. And I think I've kind of like won Jesse over to my like view on this over the <laughs> months and years, right? But yeah, yeah. Because to me, the power of the set goal is precisely that it exists as meta knowledge. It's out of character knowledge. And I think that's its power. I also feel like another thing that the set goal does is it helps prevent player exhaustion. Hmm. There's a point where the players have like, I've experienced enough in this damn dungeon and yes. and I've made some good rolls and I now have <laughs> hoarded up these things. And if I roll a one, I'm going to lose my mind. No, no, I'm not yep. dealing with this necromancer for the last bit. We're just getting the treasure and we're getting out. Whatever that means, it means. And sort of like piggyback off that the next way you engage with set goals is you can solve them just in the normal role play or you can short circuit the process or short do a shortcut and spend your three hunt roll tokens right 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 what you've just described that scenario of the exhausted play group is exactly what the hunt roll tokens are for right it's it gives the players some control over when to move things along yeah it's an opportunity for a group that's like a little more focused on the narrative rather than like the treasure gathering it's a way for them to sort of express what they're interested in doing yeah so yeah, yeah. if they're really interested if we have a set goal that's about you know say in hester's mill one of the set goals is like to discover the secret history of the village if that's something they're really into they can just get to that right and they right. don't have to like try to scrounge around for it or whatever totally. so it kind of gives a group that's very attuned to the narrative pacing and the narrative flow of the story some control over that as well yeah. i think there are ways to write cool rules for like a specific monster so that the set goals help like so for example in tomb of horrors I had a rule for the Demi Lich where it was like, hey, you can get out of the dungeon with this treasure, but you cannot spend three tokens to defeat the Demi Lich. Mm, If you're going to do it, you have to actually confront them. And if you get out with his treasure, he might very well know it's you and he might come for you later, (laughs) which is a lot of fun. But I'm just saying, if you want to actually defeat this guy, you're going to have to face him and not spend the three. There are ways to like fiddle around with the rules and and make the monsters meaningful so that you can't just spend three and get past it. But you can spend three and get what you want and get out. No, for sure. You know, one of the, this is kind of a diversion, but let's go. one of the things that is so interesting to me about set goals is how the choice of whether to spend the tokens or not to spend the tokens yeah. implicates the rules of the game. 
I'm going to ruin part of the Huntsman's Manor for Wodu. I apologize for that. But yeah. the very final set is this hunt. And the goal is basically something like do the hunt or succeed at the hunt or something like that. Right. And if you don't spend the tokens, there's a whole process of doing the hunt, which could involve your character getting killed and all this other stuff. If you spend the tokens, theoretically, you just narrate that and you don't even go to the rolls. Yeah. Right. And so it's like a, it's, it's a pretty, and I've had it go both ways because I've run Huntsman's Manor a fair amount. It's a super interesting outcome. Like it's two totally different outcomes in terms of how the experience goes at the table, but both equally valid. Yeah. One is more about like, I really want to do the roles. I want to do the combat. I want to have this like hard, crunchy, dangerous moment. And the other is about, I just want to show my character being really fucking cool and yeah. succeeding. And I, and I love that. And, I, and that's, that's a way you can write the set goals to sort of accomplish a certain type of thing in the fiction, right? And to present a real choice to the players. Yeah. I won't go any further because I don't want to root it for what doom. But. Very good. <laughs> Along with the theme, I feel like the set goals are the part of the writing that I have the most difficult with. Like, mm. and, and when something isn't working, it's usually because the set goal isn't good. Yeah. And that has caused the set to meander in some weird way or something isn't working, which is cool. It's nice to have that shorthand so that when you're looking at your adventure writing, you can see if something's not working. It's nice to be able to have these little shorthand pieces to be able to figure out what, what isn't working and why, rather than kind of this amorphous adventure description with some monster stats. You have these like pieces that are a little bit more modular and makes it a little bit more easier to fix, especially when you're running an adventure over and over. Here's where I think game design theory is really helpful. Even if you're just writing an adventure for, for that night's session, doing like some kind of quick scribbling of a set or whatever, like I had to do for Top of the World, which I'll talk about in a bit, I, I think it's helpful to think about what your design goal is. Right. To me, like when I was writing Hester's Mill, I thought about my design goals for Hester's Mill. I wanted certain things to happen in this incursion. And so I made sure to have set goals that sort of helped support that. And so one of the things that was important to me in Hester's Mill is that there's this known history, which is kind of a false history, and this secret history, which is the true history. So you have this false, this dichotomy. And one of my design goals was to make that a cool moment. Like, I want that to be a cool moment when the secret history gets revealed. I want that to be a thing. And so I made one of the set goals to literally just be to learn the secret history. Right? Yeah, yeah. That was you know, perhaps a, a blunt instrument in that regard. But um, it always comes off right in play, though, so I think I did okay. But that was kind of like what guided that decision for me, right? And that kind of guided my set goals. was like, what am I trying to accomplish here? And I think what we find in, in the conversions is it really comes down to like, what, what do you find interesting about this thing? That's true. Without the set goal, right, you could go through Hester's Mill and just never learn the secret history. And it might just be then a weird bunch of monsters around an abandoned village. It doesn't make as much sense, right? Mm. The other nice thing about the set goals is you can kind of say what's important to you about the adventure. It signposts it, right? And prompt them to get there, yeah. Yeah, it totally signposts what the incursion means for you to be doing, <laughs> right? Yep. So um, and I think that's a that's a big part of it for sure. You know, we talked yeah. about like good set goals and bad set goals. And I don't know if there's like a perfect answer here, but I kind of think that a bad one is one that's just kind of uninteresting, right? Right. E either uninteresting or doesn't move the story forward in some way. And I think it's two separate things because some set goals are very just like about moving through space, particularly for incursions that are like more straight dungeon crawls, like finding a secret door or finding the, the true tomb of the Serpent Kings or whatever, right? Right. That's just a moving from place to place. And that's a perfectly good set goal. Another type of set goal, though, I think is a little bit more like that lore focused or narrative focused or something about the world, right? Like it reveals something about the world. Yeah. And so I think there's a way that, you know, I can't say I've like seen bad set goals because I haven't like seen, we're still talking about a fairly small set of data as far as incursions go for trophy gold. But my instinct tells me that a bad one is one that's just like not interesting or doesn't do anything yeah yeah i also wonder if a bad one we're going to find is a set goal that you have to do in a very specific way yeah where there's not a lot of openness and not a lot of creative product problem solving that can be used yeah to get it that's interesting the literal very first trophy gold incursion was jesse's conversion of tomb of the serpent kings yeah one of the set goals in that one is that you find this treasure that's buried at the bottom of this like muck-filled pit right and 
the characters can just search the muck-filled pit and find the treasure, or they can spend the tokens and they get some insight that there's treasure down in the muck-filled pit, right? And they get the treasure that they now know it's there and they can go get it. That's a set goal where there is a very specific way of doing it. The treasures are not in some other part of the dungeon. They're at the bottom of the muck-filled pit. Right. But the set goal doesn't mention the muck-filled pit. <laughs> it just says, find the treasures of the Servant Kings. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. Like, And I've run that one once or twice, and they usually just spend the tokens on that one because they want the treasures. I don't know <laughs> if they've ever like searched around to find them. So yeah, but, e- know, but... E- even the muck-filled pit... Once you figure that out, you can grab your shovels and you can dig it out. You can tie ropes to the serpent statues and lower yourselves in. And, and like, mm. as long as there's, oh, like some, there's different ways of solving the problem. Yeah, as long that, as there are different yeah. ways of solving the problem, I, I think it's all right. Yeah. The set goals that I've found in my own adventure writing that have been kind of weak sauce have been when there's one way to really do it. And it just becomes, what, what, what was that old video game pixel bitching where you have to like go touch that one pixel <laughs> right yeah yeah put your hand in this hole <laughs> yeah, right? yeah 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 in exactly it. the yeah, right yeah. way and, yeah and that's when i find it's a little it's not not great so we don't have enough data yet i'm sure that people will uh, i'm excited to see folks break that rule and make something awesome anyway and and we'll have to reevaluate all of it one of the ones that we published in codex leviathan uh, by natalie ash called that colossal wreck it has puzzle like an actual like moving the dials puzzle thing. Oh, wow. But I, I'm pretty sure, if I recall correctly, you can just spend the tokens to solve the set goal to solve the puzzle. And I'm curious, I've never played this one, so I don't know how it goes, but I'm curious, like, how many players try to, like, solve it in the role play by taking actions with their characters or how many just spend the tokens right. and how that feels in play. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's an interesting idea. One thing I want to kind of, like, pivot to just briefly because this came up specifically on Discord, which was how do you use set goals in ways that have nothing to do with dungeon crawling, <laughs> right? Like how can you like use oh, set goals to do different kinds of stories? And I think this is still probably a somewhat untapped area of trophy design. And so hmm. I don't know if I have all the answers here, but I will say that I did this recently and I wanted to talk about my experience, which was, so I ran top of the world, the incursion we just talked about in the last segment. And I needed an on-the-fly set because the group did decide to go spend some time with an important named NPC. I wanted to make this kind of a special moment, and so in between sessions, I created a little set that was essentially a like a horror house set. It was a this creepy family. They have weird beliefs, and it's kind of bloody and gross. Just a classic kind of creepy family thing. That's my jam all the way. The sequel that I wrote for it was discover the horrific truth of what's going on in this household. Nice, nice. Nothing to do with dungeon crawling. But the effect on the gameplay was profound because what it did was it immediately set the tone for what was about to happen. So they go into this guy's house not expecting it to be a horror scenario. Like they just think it's just some guy that they're going to spend the night with. Yeah. But then I say the set goal and suddenly they're like, oh, <laughs> there, right. there is a horrific truth here, right? There's something scary going on. And it just totally changed the way that they played their characters. It totally changed the way they interacted with the various parts of the house. And um, and it was great, like, because the set goal in that instance was 100% just signposting, this is what's going to happen right now. This is, the, this is what's happening. And it just totally shifted everyone's perspective. And I thought it was very powerful. And they could have played the whole scenario without ever learning the horrific secret. They could have just like wallowed in the tension and never really learned it. And it still would have been fine because because they're expecting the tension. Even if they right. never learn the truth of it, they know there's something there and that's enough. I thought it was interesting. It sets the background music. You know, in, in movies, we all know because like the background music changes. Exactly, right. That's exactly what it was like. Yeah. yeah. So that's one way person on discord who was asking about this um, I, I can't remember who it was i apologize but yeah i'd be curious to see how this develops though like how people use set goals in particular as a way of shaping different types of genre stories in yeah. trophy gold i think that'd be pretty cool i could see ways to use it if you wanted to make a more open city as an incursion just have the players are visiting the city you're kind of running it vaguely like an incursion and just have 
barter with someone in the bazaar, yeah, get into a knife fight on the docks, all the weird little experiences you want players to have in that in that city. And of course, they'll move beyond those experiences and find new things, kind of cool ways to set expectations for an adventure. Yeah, it's yeah, good stuff. That's awesome. Yeah, I love that. Well, let's go to the next segment. Woven on the Loom. Okay, so keeping with our city theme, we are going to present a couple of things we've created that are are, are things you might find in a city. <laughs> so, yeah. Judd, what do you have for us? So, I made the city guard as a monster because I vividly remember my friends playing those old SSI D&D video games on their Commodore 64s. I think it was like Pool of Radiance or whatever it was. Those kinds of games, you move this little icon around and and you've Mm -hmm. got a party. Whenever you messed up and did something, the city guard would come and just slam you. And I vividly (laughs) remember when my friend was like, you know what? We're fifth level. We're taking on the city guard. F them. (laughs) And they like stole something. And then the whole city guard came and they picked like a part of the city where they thought they could take them. And they did. But yeah, it just reminded me of those old SSI games where the city guard comes to mess with you. The six things that city guards do, whistle to call more guards, hits you with their cudgel covered in evenly spaced rusty nail heads. Hmm. They assure you they just want to ask a few simple questions before they hit you. (laughs) They stall for comrades to arrive, asking you to consider the consequences of your actions. Hmm. Pull a magic wand with X spell D6 charges. That might not fit the tone of your campaign, but I thought it was kind of, it was something that I remembered from the video game is that the city guard had a wizard with them and it was like a big deal. They were throwing around magic missiles. It was a whole thing. So in homage to that, I threw the magic wand in and then, you know, drags you into an alley to work away from prying eyes. Their endurance is six plus one for every one by which the guards outnumber the treasure hunters. Nice. Yeah. Like that's interesting. These are folks who are used to numbers being up, right? They, right. when numbers yeah. are up, they're pretty strong. Strengths are they know the area, locals are terrified of them or see them as their only protection from greedy treasure hunters. Mm. Uh, They've got boiled leather armor with the worn city crest embossed on the chest. The armor is older than most of the treasure hunters. Their weaknesses are when they're outnumbered or obviously overpowered by sorcery or weaponry and when they're attacked by blooded veterans of battle. Yeah, they're not, I think they're not used to dealing with people who have been in a lot of fights. Yeah, no, that's great. This is great because it's like kind of such a classic kind of city scenario, right? And yeah. I like how you're sort of, you have mechanized, there's sort of like strength in numbers kind of things that, yeah. that we see yeah, yeah. in these scenarios a lot. Pretty cool. My creation is the pub crawl, <laughs> which is something you can only do in a city. Nice. In the spirit of the sketchiness of this segment, listeners, I will tell, <laughs> you, I will tell you that I wrote this in like five minutes. It probably doesn't work. <laughs> You know, it might need some massaging or changing. Uh, maybe some somebody will chime in and let me know how awful it is. But here's how the pub crawl goes. The pub crawl works like a combat roll against a monster with endurance 10. When rolling your weak point, you state how you are vulnerable to either pickpockets, excessive drunkenness, or unwise dares. For your choice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Instead of gaining ruin if your weak point is rolled during the combat, you either gain a condition inspired by the narration, which cannot be cleared before you go to an incursion, or lose one gold, your choice. If the combat roll is successful, roll gold dice as normal. In the fiction, this represents the new friends you have made this night and the resources they give you access to. Nice. Additionally, everyone who participated in the pub crawl gains a new skill called drunking. So that is my my pub crawl roll. It's I, it's not good. <laughs> no, I like it. I like it. But, you know, I think it'd be pretty harmless to give it a shot. See how it goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, and I think that's one of the fun things of Trophy Gold in particular, and Trophy uh, Trophy Dark is that they're pretty resilient, right? Like you can, yeah, you, you can, can throw a shitty idea at them. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not going to break the game. Whereas, like, nope. I, I vividly remember like making magic items and and monsters that decimated my the overpowered or whatever yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it wasn't good so anyway uh, you know it's harmless e- either way so it, right. that was my thinking yeah yeah well so th- those are our city things listeners we hope you enjoyed them let's go to see what Woe doom's up to yeah desperate and doomed so Woe doom the last time we saw you you were searching the north wing of the hunting lodge 
going through a series of small rooms, and you discovered a couple of interesting things. Principally, you were looking at a candle for a good long while and noticing that the candle dripped its wax like normal, but then reversed itself and then repeated the process, almost like it was stuck in a sort of like repeating time loop kind of thing. Yeah. And shortly after that, you started to hear the pitter-patter of, or no, you made a call. You did like a wolf call or something, didn't you? Yeah, I, I imitated a wolf call that I think yeah. I heard. Yeah. Yeah, you imitated a wolf call and you heard the pitter-patter of wolf paws coming down the hallway, responding to the call. But then coming around the corner was a woman who was dressed in a, I can't remember the color now, but I'm going to say purple, a sort of purple crushed velvet gown, jewels at her throat with a sort of lupine grin on her face. And she said something like, she didn't expect to see you. And you said, well, I didn't expect to see you. And that's where we right. stopped. You also let me know that she's the wolf. Uh, yeah. I mean, I kind of strongly hinted that because yeah, okay. no wolf came around the corner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. She says, so I have to ask you the question. A two-part question. One, what are you doing here? And two, why does that involve impersonating a wolf? Wanted to see who would come if I called. Are you disappointed? I'm surprised. Hmm. And at this point, she's doing this thing where she sort of is circling you. Yeah, yeah. And I think I'm just like, uh, you probably hear like the squeak of the metal as I like am <laughs> keeping my feet planted, but I'm, I'm rotating around to kind of keep her. Like on a ball bearing or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, good. I love it. She says, you know, it's interesting. You and I aren't really all that different. I suppose that's surprising to you as well. You are somewhat like a man. You are vaguely shaped like one. But you are not a man. And I look like a woman. But I am very much not a woman. And so, now that we have established that we have something in common, we can be fast friends, can't we? What would our friendship entail? I've never had a friend. Then she gets a little close to you. And she thwips a hand fan out and sort of speaks to you behind it as if sharing a secret with you. Mm -hmm. And she says, well, friends share secrets. We say things to each other that we don't want other people to know. What's your secret? My secret is that I was hoping you would get close to me. Oh? And I close my manacles around her wrists. <laughs> Good. <laughs> That's definitely a risk roll. Yeah. So you've stated what you want to do. Yeah. I think what could go wrong here is that uh, obviously you just you just fail to do so or she's faster than you. Right. And then she strikes back. I think the more interesting thing here is the dice. So you're using your manacles. That gives you one light die. Yep. Let's talk about the, the second light die yeah. for the devil's bargain. Yeah. The way we're going to do this is I make a proposition and you can counter offer. Yep. And my offer for the devil's bargain is... You manage to get the manacles around her hands, but she manages to get stuck to you somehow as well. Uh, yeah, I'm all for this being kind of a close thing. Absolutely. Okay. And I don't think you're necessarily risking mind or body yet, so go ahead and just roll your two light dice. Oh, I'm not? Okay, great. I don't think so. Not yet. I think you could get there, I, but... I, I had that die. I had that dark die right out. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh my, a one and a two. <laughs> Would you like to add a dark die now and try again? Yes. I always forget about that. Great. Uh, so I got a six on a light die and then a five on the dark die. Nice. So, so six light. That's great. Yep. You succeed completely. Narrate up to the point of her getting stuck on you as well. I get the manacles around her wrists, but I think the manacles are, are kind of wrapped up around me. And so, yeah, I, I just didn't take that into account i think when i was when i was turning i was kind of like turning them around myself and i didn't realize that when i did that a lot of the slack that was in them is now gone yeah it's like it's all wrapped up my torso and she's super close yep and she's kind of like pressed up against you because like the chain is sort of like wrapped up in part of your mechanism yeah and she says well this is Certainly a very, very sticky situation. <laughs> I, oh, this is not what Wood wanted. He is not prepared for this. Like, he doesn't know well enough to blush, but I am blushing on his behalf. 
how do you change shape? She says, Oh, I don't think you want to see that, but I'm happy to demonstrate it for you. No, let's put a pin in that. I think like I walk her over to the candles and I say, what's, what is that? Oh, good. You've noticed that then. Now you are starting to ask the right questions, my friend. This place is constantly reliving a mad drama of the Marquis Niral, and we are all caught up in it. We are all actors in his never-ending, ever-looping play. Now you are, too. Have you been here since the beginning? I have been here for a very long time. And I will not be able to leave, none of us will be able to leave, until the Marquis manages to finally bag his prey. The prey that has eluded him for years and years. He's hunting a wolf, I presume? (laughs) So many things to learn yet. I'm afraid we are in a bit of a weird situation, though, because I can't free myself of you, and you can't free yourself of me. We shall have to, perhaps, go to the feast together. Wode undoes the manacles and says, I'm sorry, I thought you were... I thought you were a more dire threat. Oh, I am, in general. A more immediate threat. And I think I kind of untangle the, the chains for myself and kind of like wrap it around one forearm so that it kind of Mm. is a nice loop and put it on my belt again. She kind of takes your arm and says, let's leave this place. We're going to some sort of feast, you said? Oh, yes. And there are so many delights on the menu. (laughs) And we'll end there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. Oh, naive (laughs) woad. And listeners, that's our show. The Sixth Ring is part of the Trophy Podcast, which is a production of The Gauntlet. You can find us on Twitter at Gauntlet RPG. We have a website. It's gauntlet-rpg.com. If you'd like to support this show financially, we love that. It's patreon.com forward slash gauntlet. Judd, thank you so much. Jason, thank you. It's fun to play bite-sized parts of World every week. It's nice. Or a <laughs> couple times a well. month or however often we're doing this time. I like, to play, I like to play vampy NPCs, so it yeah. works for me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And wonderful editor, Rich. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. And listeners, thank you as well. Take care. Hi listeners, Jason from Gauntlet Publishing here. I want to tell you about a couple of new things we have for you this month. The first is Nephews in Peril, a major expansion for Brindlewood Bay, the game of cozy murder mysteries and supernatural horror. Nephews in Peril is a collection of six new mysteries for the game, each by a different fabulous author and some revised rules and gameplay advice. It can be found in the $6 plus Gauntlet Patreon feed until October 15th and then drive through RPG after that. The next thing I want to tell you about is Codex Home, the first issue in Volume 5 of the magazine. Codex Home features new material for Trophy Gold in Brindlewood Bay, plus the all-new game Back Again from the Broken Land, which is about fantasy heroes recounting stories as they return home from a calamitous war against a Dark Lord, all while evading the remnants of that Dark Lord's army. It's a fantastic Powered by the Apocalypse game, and we're delighted to share it with you later in October. Remember, your contributions to the Gauntlet Patreon help support everything we do in the community, including this very podcast. As always, thanks so much for your support.